Uh, welcome back to track one. I'd like to introduce uh, here up on stage we have uh, Raf, who's a technical lead from Fairfax here in New Zealand. Um, and on the screen, who you'll see shortly, we have Paul, who's a psychologist from the University of Plymouth, all the way over in the UK. Please welcome Raf and Paul. Thanks. So, um, yep, I have been working with Agile methodologies um, since the early sort of 2000s using XP-like techniques um, such as uh, pair programming, um, TDD. And I've seen you know, the benefits of those techniques for bringing in early feedback. Uh, Paul and I, many years ago, we pair programmed together. Paul is a former developer. And we pair programmed on a, um, a web automation framework, a testing framework. And our experience was really positive. You know, at the end of every day, we would get together and we'd sort of retrospect on what made it so efficient. And speculate about cognitive processes and such. Now, Paul has actually become a psychologist, and we've um, remained in touch. Uh, he uh, and I continue to... Uh, we paired about a year ago on an Angular thing he was working on, which, surprisingly, was also using... Uh, interestingly, was also using D3. Um, and um, we continue to speculate. Now, because he's a real psychologist, he's holding me back. I'm not allowed to speculate. Uh, so everything you hear will be based on real experience. Say whatever you want. God. <laughs> And because we're remote, you'll get bits of, um, uh, you'll get funny things like that happening from time to time. Uh, Paul, do you want to step in? Oh, um, uh, you want me to say what I do? Yeah, so I am a PhD student, so I have to warn you that I'm, um, pair programming is not my area of expertise. I'm actually studying meditation for my PhD, so uh, go easy on me. But I'm so grateful for you letting me into your country because ours is going going down the tubes at the moment, so <laughs> I might be asking you for a visa or something. So. Uh, yeah, he's on the, <laughs> yeah, Paul's on the North Island, the, the really far North Island. Um, so he's, he's quite humble. He, he does actually ask questions about psychology and um, computer science regularly, and he even revealed to me that there was a study uh, uh, quite recently where at Seville University where they found that meditation results in um, people modeling really complex domains with greater efficiency, being able to grasp those complex concepts. Uh, but when, that's not what we're talking about today. So this is a quick um, drop-in to show places um, we've solutioned, um, written for, researched, whatever. So we're not completely off the street. Um, but oh, and I'm with Stuff, and we're hiring. So uh, full stack developers, lots of Node on our on our stack. The practices we mentioned today uh, are being practiced within our teams. Um, so if you're interested, um, hit me up afterwards. Okay. So. This is a rough sort of like format which we'll be taking here. Uh, we had initially named the talk Pair Programming, the Psychology and the Art of Pair Programming. It was actually Zen and the Art of Pair Programming. Then we made it Psychology. And what we did was we paired on the, you know, on, on the piece itself. And we found that you know, Pair Programming didn't really describe what we're after. Um, we're talking about uh, building good software using you know, things that come innately to us, social constructs, language constructs that have helped people to survive for a very long time. And they're, you know, they've, they've evolved efficiencies. Um, we're going to look at that. So I'm going to talk about the benefits, some of the history. We'll jump into patterns. So these are sort of sorts of things my teams are using, things I've used in the past. You know, if you wanted to start using pairing, do you just jump into it? Or maybe this will give you a guide. And then Paul's going to hit on the research. Um, because we're cramming in so much, uh, there is... you want to talk about the remote, Paul? Yes. So um, I gave you your... There's a, did you put that slide in? So there's like a, a remote... Uh, there's a Q&A in a week's time um, that's uh, suited for both time zones. There's a URL for this, which is on a slide somewhere, I think. Yeah, that's, that's the one. Screen. And... Um, I can say as much as you like or as little as you like about that. Um, um, what? Do you Sorry? want to talk about this? And, uh, Paul, uh, keep quiet. Going, Paul, Paul, oh. Paul, I'm in the zone. You're disturbing me. Oh, stop. All right. I, I have complex oh, state sorry. in my head, and you're talking in the background. Now, you know, I got into programming because I enjoy the challenge of solving complex problems. And 
you know, I, 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 you get an endorphin kick when you're building, you know, complex solutions. You're designing things. You're managing multiple things as a state in your head, and then you are forced into conversation. I, I practiced Pomodoro years ago to avoid those interruptions so I could concentrate. So the question, and this was a question to me at some stage, you know, what could be more wasteful than someone else coming along and interrupting you? You know, what, what, what is more wasteful than that? And it's true. You know, the, 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 the research does show that there is an overhead. Um, across multiple papers, you know, there's like a 15 and 100% overhead. This is actually taken from one which uh, averages across a larger set. Um, so we're probably done then. But we're not. There are things which are more wasteful than the absolute developer time that goes into solving a problem. And those are the mistakes we make. Those are the misinterpretations around the solution we're trying to build. You know, a lot of the time when you're building in the workplace, you're trying to solve a problem. There are complex communication sort of chains around it. Requirements, you know, Chinese whispers, multiple people trying to uh, express their, you know, their, their ideation, which has flown into something you're building. And that it's easy to get that wrong. Um, the sooner you're able to trap misunderstandings, even in your code, you know, your mistakes, divergences from uh, what you should be building, those bugs will cost more the later they're picked up. Uh, once you're in production, they cost the most. But the, the place to can't trap, trap them you know, most effectively is when you are building that solution. You, know, you have just implemented it. And if so, there's someone next to you to challenge, actually, is that the way to go? There's great value in that. Even better if you, know, that, uh, you have richer conversations around what you're building beforehand. Um, the other one is rework. You know, re code review. Who does code review here? Right, and, and you get a lot of feedback from that. The thing is, code review is happening late in that cycle. It's you've implemented, you've built things, you've pushed it through a pipeline. It still has value. Yeah, absolutely. But Rework often has, and I've seen it happen time and time again, where you, you submit something for review, and it's, you've made the compromises, and it's not acceptable to go through. But there's a decision point there. Do I release? Do I not? And quite often, the business pressures. I've seen things go out. And now we have the concept of technical debt. You know, the, the, the inefficiencies in your code, which will make delivering future features harder, uh, complexity around reading your code. And sometimes you make the decision to push things out. That wasn't a conscious decision at the point of building that I'm introducing technical debt because you know, it's, it's something that makes sense to deliver this. This is a late decision saying, oh dear, look, we've got something which is beneath our, our quality bar. We're pushing it out. So the early history here is um, we were looking at you know, where this sort of stuff kicked in. It was interesting. So Fred Brooks, Brooks of the Mythical Man Month, um, uh, he did early pair programming with punch cards. And uh, they did about 1,500 lines, worked the first time. That's you know big investment, punch cards. Uh, 1962 was Dijkstra uh, working on a compiler on, uh, at Harvard. And he intentionally brought in a second pair. Now, he tried to tackle syntax errors by diffing punch cards, um, and he said that was the trivial thing. The hard thing was thinking errors, design errors. You know, he wanted validation as and when he was building it. So you jump ahead, 1990s. This is kind of where I think a lot of us fell into this, this pair programming sort of paradigm TDD and stuff came from the XP movement. Um, Kent Beck, Ward Cunningham, others um, had worked on a project, C3 at Chrysler. Um, it was a big HR system, huge project. Um, it got canned, it got started, but they introduced, when they came in, um, XP methodologies, which weren't coined that, you know, the term wasn't coined yet, uh, pair programming. Uh, people like Ward Cunningham, the guy who introduced the concept of tech debt, you know, ha has written in, in one of the papers about the positive benefits, you know, the happiness in the team. There's, there's a, a, a pleasantness in there. I'm not discounting, you know, you hacking away in the corner because that can also innovate, but, you know, there, there are positive examples there. Okay, patterns. Um, we're going to go and talk about you know, some of the, the ways you can implement pair programming. Um, there are multiple patterns here. Uh, pairing is the most obvious. It's the two people. And then you've got the situation where you have more than two people. And that can actually be effective. So two people first. All right, so this is my son, Josh, at Code Club. And I've got young kids pairing. And the most elementary form of pairing, even when you don't have all the discipline, is something we do innately quite often. It's something called rubber ducking. It's that situation where um, you have been staring at something for an hour, two hours, whatever, and you can't crack why it's not working. 
uh, it's, it, you, you've covered every potential base there. And there's this notion of, um, of uh, what's it called? Uh, Paul, fixation, fixation, finished sentence? Um, I don't know. Okay. Ow. This is where pairing fails. Um, the, the, you're fixated <laughs> within your current context. Your context is bounded, and you're not seeing the bigger picture. So, oh, um, I know what you mean now. Go on. You mean functional fixedness, right? Functional fixedness, absolutely. That's it. Um, yeah. Should be in the presentation mode. Don't know how I got out. All right, so um, there's this notion. You've got this closed context. Then you call someone over, or you go for a coffee, and you chat with someone, and suddenly the whole world comes together before you've even articulated what you're saying. Um, we were, should we do a demo of that, Paul? <laughs> we had a contrived yeah, demo. Yeah, we can do that. All right, so, so this is my play <laughs> acting. We did lots of play acting. Now I know what it is. You know what it is. Darn it. All right, so Paul, I've been looking at this thing for ages, and um, should I, actually, should I bring it up? No, nah, yeah, I can't. I All can't right, we, 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 we haven't actually got a, a visual to show you, because we were going to record it, then we're going to do it live. But Paul, I'm looking at this bit of code, and it's been driving me crazy. And there's this algorithm. I've covered every, every yeah, well. single potential. Oh. That's the moment, that O is the moment where you realize it was something like, you know, the, the, the case of a constant or something being compared. And it's often something trivial, but the, the points connect. The important thing is here, here is you're externalizing something which was very internal. And in that process of externalization, um, what happens is you're taking uh, what was, you know, in this confined state and you're re expressing it, you're reevaluating it. Uh, let's get back to slides. This is great. It's a magical thing. I think a lot of people have experienced it. I remember when it happened to me for the first time, it was m mystical. It's mystical. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so next paradigm here is the driver navigator. Um, we're talking about roles. You get two people together. Now, when I started pairing, it would be two people sitting together, and you're trying to figure out how you're pairing, or you're building the same thing. And you have like a, a, a relationship where you're talking. This is the most fa famous paradigm you can start trying out, where you recognize the roles. The idea is that you have a separation of responsibility. You can focus your mental attention in one area. Uh, it's a bit more involved than that once you evolve you know, through the practices. But the very basic is the driver is the person at the keyboard. That driver has state around um, the programming language, around the IDE, the build tools, around you know, the code base at that stage. Um, navigator can hold more complex state. The navigator can hold state around the requirements a little more, around the design. Now, obviously, you need to keep talking. You need to have a shared understanding where you're heading. But as you iterate through the process, um, the navigator can drive the driver a bit more, let them focus on building. So. We're going to do, uh, show a demo of this. We were going to do it live, but we decided we'd record it because of transatlantic issues potentially kicking in and costing us time. We got scared, is what he means. Yeah, we were terrified about things like this, whether the um, audio on this is not available. Hello. Oh, this thing is there. How do I get I'm it? stalling for you. You are stalling for me. We can talk through it. <laughs> so this thing is supposed to have audio. These things happen when you do live um, videos for you present. Play. So we have a scenario pray. here. Did you, say, did you say pray or play? I said both, actually. <laughs> All right, so we have a scenario here. Right. We, 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 we can, we can ad-lib it, Paul. So um, the, the, the scenario here was that we're both Let's wearing do it hats. Woo! <laughs> I'm the navigator. Paul is the driver here. And we had a conversation, and I'm like, all right, we've got some requirements. The requirements are fairly you know, basic. They're that um, we have this concept of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. We're going to add a lookup in it for something called Betel Goose 5. And um, based on that, we're going to start implementing it. So in the role of the navigator, I tell him where to go. And the first place I tell him to go to is a source file, which is the test file. And he arrives in here, and there's an existing test. So we have a conversation. I say, Paul, um, can you yes. 
uh, can you perhaps take that Earth template and stick in a second test for uh, the uh, for Betel Goose? And yeah, let's see if this plays now. Done that. All right, and he does that. Is it? He's still there. Yeah, I've there. been told my audio is muted, but it's not. It's different audio that's muted. I can still hear you. Yeah, you can still hear me. All right, so we're just mm. going to continue, and I'll, I'll, I'll narrate. That's unfortunate, but hopefully you'll get the idea. So there's a there's a rich interaction. Drop in whenever you want, Paul, um, where you write yeah. you write the test now. The sad thing is, the, the, the magic in this is that we're interacting in real time. Narration is important. You know, as you're doing this, you're talking about the processes in your head. You're speaking out loud. Um, you're being as vulnerable as you can be. You're saying, this is what I'm thinking. What's that? And it's, it's, it's a real time process. Um, I direct can they see Paul. the code? Sorry? Can they see the code at the moment? Or? Uh, you should be able to if you flip back to um, the presentation view. I mean, yeah, I can't see anything. It can, it's the code on screen, I mean. I, I'll, I'll walk through it, because I think we're going to get distracted. So real-time pairing, thinking. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so this is where um, we uh, then go off, and then Paul is directed to go to the implementation. It's a fairly basic test, so the code doesn't really matter here so much as the relationship, which is being lost. Um, we run tests. <laughs> I, I direct him to run the tests. No, it hasn't. He implements the tests. We run uh, implement code. Code fails. What we're doing is in real time, we're forcing TDD to happen. Um, we're forcing a journey where uh, there's shared learning. Uh, we talk about refactoring in the process. Um, we add a to do somewhere, possibly in the next one. And we continue. Now, we did sound check this yesterday, so I don't know why this is not working. But uh, <laughs> the, the, the general feel then, we've probably got some time out of it, is that. You know, you're communicating continuously. All right, so next. And we did, honestly. We did, honestly. All right, so you continue from there. Um, some of the heads in there and stuff are actually in this room, so if you want to go and ask them and you recognize them <laughs> about their experiences, they might be able to tell you what the first person perspective is like. So there's another pattern which is more suited to um, instruction. Now, I'd say use this in moderation, and this is one that does actually happen quite often in the workplace. It's, it's one where you bring in the noob. You bring in someone who doesn't have experience in the domain, maybe the tooling you have, and you pair them. You know, you've got Sarah coming in. You say, Sarah, pair with Sally because she's familiar with this area. Sarah sits next to Sally, and Sally kind of walks her through. Now, this is highly instructive. It's, it's the driver sort of saying, look, this is this, this is that, navigate to this file, um, and there's little, collab there's, there's little in the way, uh, of, way of feedback from the driver, because the driver doesn't really know the domain. There may be questions. Um, I'd say use this one in limitation, because one of the benefits around pairing is that you're creating empowerment around the code. It's not one person's code. It's our code. It's our platform. Um, there's, uh, uh, there's almost like a, a, a shared hierarchy as well. You know, you're the, the, the more senior person, but I'm also a contributor. We learn from each other. Um, and you, you can lose that if you keep the hierarchy there. All right, so the next one um, is test ping pong, which was also going to have a demo. Uh, test ping pong is the situation where the roles are a bit like in a ping pong match. So you've got a person who serves. And the thing you're serving in this case is not a ball, it's a test. So you have understanding around the requirements. You decide it you know, between the two of you. And then you, someone implements a test. It can be, you know, at... And depending on your, the methodology you're following, it's the appropriate tier of your testing stack. Um, but someone may write a unit test, the other person implements it. You have shared understanding around what you're trying to build. There's ownership. You know, it's, it's, I've seen in the driver navigator situation, you need to keep engaged. And sometimes, depending on personalities, the driver can completely take over. Um, you want to keep both engaged. This kind of ensures it, and it ensures that you have code quality all the way through. All right, so let's see if this one works with audio. Yay. The last one. All Yay. right, so, so we're doing Mars this time. Um, so copy the test, should describe Mars. So I'll pull this back to the beginning. Okay. Hey, Paul. 
you want to do some test ping pong with that Mars story? Yeah. Is so this is carrying on from the last one. All right, so, so we're doing Mars this time. Um, so copy the test. Should describe Mars. Big Mars. Uh, so we need to look up Mars. Hey, it just reverted. What happened there? Uh, so look up Mars. So he's doing some typing. He puts in a test case. And we yeah. continue. We run okay, the test. The running test reveals that it fails as expected. Everything else is working. So I'll do the implementation. I'm going to stick this in the copy buffer and I'm going to go into Hyker.js. So it seems we've got planets here, which is an object with all our planet definitions. Yeah. I'm going to put um, Mars in there. And. Um, Comma on the end. Yeah, planning comma, thanks. And I'm going to run the test, see how this goes. They come up with. So there's some feedback, um, and I'm, I'm going to jump ahead again right. to cater time. And the test pass, we celebrate and we continue. Then the important thing is you swap roles. You don't want to hold on to or hog um, that situation. And once you've swapped roles, you sort of continue from there. There we go. Switch roles and. Okay, and the next sort of thing. So you swap roles and you do it again, and you sh you keep you know sort of swapping states, so no one person hogs any domain knowledge. Now the ultimate, and I've got here with certain people, is that you hit what we call rally, and rally is where you're just kind of speeding ahead. So we talked about those social constructs. We talked about all of these things. A really difficult thing in pairing is getting to know the people you're with, getting into that comfort zone, getting into the place where you can kind of finish each other's sentences and you know where you're heading. Now, with Rally, it's, it's really a case of, yes, there are roles. And the research, um, this was Sally's, right? So, um, Sally uh, Freudenberg um, writes about those roles not being so clear because they start blurring as you become effective. You are implementing together. There's collaborative ownership. But you've got to a stage where you're thinking very much alike. And that really takes long-term investment and long-term pairing. The next from here is the many people. So many people is, uh, takes a couple of forms. Yes, you can do many. Um, the easiest, most basic of this is something called swarming, which we've done, which involves people of different expertise um, working together. Now, one of the differences with pairing where you've got the one keyboard is you may have multiple input devices. They're working towards the same, the same goal. And the important thing is you have one thing on the board. You have one feature that you're focused on. You know, there's no distraction. There's, a, there's a, a, an effort between a group of people to deliver together. From there, um, you might evolve. And this is something my team here are doing. Um, it was introduced by, uh, it's called Mobbing, and it was introduced by a company called Hunter Industry, a guy called Woody Zool. There may be others behind it, uh, but they kind of made it big. And their entire organization has mobs. Um, they found the effective mob size about five people or so, because if one person is not there, the rest of the mob can continue. They're shared state across them. But it's very hard. You need to be able to calibrate over a period of time to, to, to get over the human difficulties. Um, think about your workspace. These guys here, they've got um, uh, a single screen. They're working together with a single terminal. They rotate the roles. And the rota role rotation is really important. Um, you need a, a nominated driver to start with. Uh, someone starts only the keyboard. And expect collisions when you start this. It's hard. You know, you've got multiple people. They want to solve it their own ways. And that driver is probably in the best place to moderate. Use TDD if you can, because TDD is a shared understanding about where you're heading, what you're building. And the important thing is the driver thinks out loud. His state needs to uh, emanate back to those um, uh, drivers. And also, in the, as I said, in the driver position, as this is thing is building, the relationship is building, you're probably in a place to moderate because you're going to have multiple views coming in. And you know, as part of the journey of my team, I saw that the initial phases, there was some, um, you know, some tension there as people learned to not be able to grab the keyboard. Um, but you know, everyone's mature, and they were able to evolve to a place where, if you look at them now, you know, the, the team have opted for mobbing. And the reason, that, uh, the reason the team have opted for mobbing is because they're moving towards that rally thing with a group of people. 
Test ping pong works there as well. It's more like round the table test ping pong. Someone writes a test, someone implements it, push it around. Everyone else is a driver. OK, so I said it's very difficult. And it's difficult because you need to be vulnerable when you're doing these things. You need to stay engaged. Um, you need to keep at it, and you need to give it a chance. Be authentic, be vulnerable. Um, there's something called Tuckman's uh, rules of um, team formation, or these phases. Uh, I'll let you look it up later, but essentially it says you start with like conflict and you get to a place where you can be more performant. Um, I'm going to jump uh, into psychology here, so I'm going to hand over to Paul. I think lots of these benefits are there. Uh, we'll save uh, psychological safety for the uh, Crowdcast next week. Paul, do you want to pick it up? Um, yeah, okay, so I'm going to go very quickly over the first couple of slides. Um, because I think we're a little bit short of time. So the, I just wanted to make the point that what you people do is, um, is a complex uh, psychological activity. You're really, when you're programming, you're holding a lot of um, things in short-term memory. You're working your working memory very hard. Um, so by programming in groups, you're potentially um, solving this problem by spreading the cognitive load. Um, this slide is really just to, to tell you what psychologists do. They're scientists, so they apply the scientific method. Um, I'm going to assume that you know what that is, really. Um, that should be fair. Because we're a bit short of time. So, um, so yeah, you can you can you can put the uh, the psychologist slide up for a, for a second. You know. We, collect, we design experiments principally, we do collect other types of data, we analyze that data quantitatively or qualitatively, we interpret the results hopefully in a way that um, allows them to be applied. So yeah, you can go to the next slide. So what I really wanted to do was talk about two uh, research papers that I looked at um, around pair programming. So the first one really kind of comes from the computer science side of things. And the, the headline is that the, uh, the costs of pair programming outweigh the benefits. So this was the quantitative stuff. The quantitative results are in bold on this slide. And they came from a study where they compared um, individual um, software engineering uh, undergrads against pairs on the same tasks. Uh, so in that study, they found only a 15% overhead in the pairs. Um, the design quality uh, was improved um, in terms of uh, fewer lines of code in the solutions that the pairs produced. So that was their measure of high quality. Less, defect, less defects, so the, the test suite that was used, um, uh, the, the of the pairs pass more of the tests than the individuals. And then they they kind of correlated this with some interview data, which where people were saying that staffing risks are reduced because um, amongst people, so one person leaves, they don't take all the knowledge with them. Um, technical skills were enhanced through a kind of apprenticeship of like working in um, rotating pairs and um, just kind of learning from each other. In general, team communication has improved. And overall, people just enjoy doing it. So next slide. Um, so this, uh, this second study, this delves a little bit deeper into what's actually, I love this title, the, uh, the mysterious role of the navigator. Uh, um, so the, uh, the, the solution to this mystery is what, so what they did in this study, they, they, this wasn't an experiment. This was actually what they call verbal protocol analysis. So it's basically, um, a uh, um, a narrative, like they capture the narrative of what people are saying when they pair programming and analyze that. And so these were pairs, they had six months of experience. They all had six months of experience. Um, and the finding is kind of counterintuitive to some of the things that uh, Raf was saying in the, in this particular sample, uh, the navigators, they're not reviewing code really. They're not kind of, um, checking what the driver is doing and making sure that um, things aren't slipping through to the testing phase for, you know, just through silly mistakes. Um, and they're also, then they're, they're not, um, uh, they're not the one who's holding the complex state um, 
where the driver is just kind of like doing what they say, basically. So they're not kind of acting as a form. And what's really happening is there's more of this kind of a tag team, which is a bit more like the ping pong scenario, actually. So they what they found was that there's uh, both people in the pair have, were holding this common sort of intermediate level of abstraction and then switching roles. So next slide. I imagine five minutes warning has probably gone up. I can't see it. But um, so my conclusion anyway was that um, I think that this, there's art and science going on here. So there's, uh, these are complementary things. And that where um, software methodologies are, um, people use their intuition in coming up with these methodologies and they're empirically tested that you, know, you get a flavor for what works and what doesn't work. Scientists can draw on an extensive literature of distributed cognition, things like communities of practice, to guide these methodologies. And they can also validate them by uh, taking measurements and applying the scientific method. And they haven't yet done this in the, in the larger group work. So I really think there's, uh, there's a role for psychologists there. All right. Um, we're going to wrap up <laughs> next week on Tuesday. Um, we're going to be available here. So, oops. Oh. Can we get, just get that last slide up? Yeah, if you can grab that. Um, we'll be available for questions and um, we'll take them then. Great. Um, thank you very much, Ref and Paul. <laughs>